Thank you for that welcome. Um, and for those of us that are guests and allies, I would like to remind us that we can help by removing the racist monuments and symbols in our culture. For those of you who don't know, we've just removed the early days sculpture from San Francisco Civic Center. Um, and so thank you to my colleagues and that effort over this past year. Um, and now it's my great honor to welcome you all um, and to introduce three incredible artists and visionaries. My name is Tom DeCaney. I'm the Director of Cultural Affairs at the San Francisco Arts Commission. Um, and we're thrilled um, to be here in this incredible tent in an art space. Um, I think that's an inspiration for future conferences. Um, and I have to just give a big thank you to Eddie and to Nadia and everybody who worked so hard to make sure that we could not cross the picket line today. So without further ado, I will first introduce McLeet. McLeet is an Ethio-American vocalist, singer, songwriter, and composer, making music that sways between cultures and continents. Known for her eclectic stage presence, innovative take on Ethio jazz, and her fiery live shows, which we recently got to see at the Americans for the Arts convention in San Francisco. McLeet is rock stages from Addis Ababa, to San Francisco, her beloved home base, to New York City, London, DC, Montreal, Nairobi, Chicago, LA, Rome, and around the world. Her latest album, When the People Move, The Music Moves You, too, was released in June 2017 on Six Degrees Records. Produced by multi-Grammy winner Dan Wilson, it features world-renowned musicians Andrew Bird and the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. These 11 songs were inspired by a conversation between Makleet and Malatu Astakati, the godfather of Ethio jazz. He tasked her to keep innovating and to, keep, to find her contribution to the globally beloved sound that he pioneered. Makleet is a TED senior fellow and her TED talk, The Unexpected Beauty of Everyday Sounds, has been watched by more than 1.2 million people. That's an impressive hit. <laughs> She's received musical commissions from Lincoln Center and the MAP Fund and has ex toured extensively across the United States, the UK, and East Africa. McLeet has been an artist in residence at NYU, collaborated with NASA astrophysicist, astrophysicist John Jenkins, musical legend Pee Wee Ellis, and members of the BBC Philharmonic. She's the co-founder of the Nile Project and a featured voice in the UN Women theme song, alongside Angelique Kijo and Anishka Shankar. So welcome, McLeet. Thank you. Next, it's my honor to introduce Michael Morgan. Michael Morgan was raised in Washington, D.C., where he attended public schools and being, began conducting at the age of 12. His operatic debut was in 1982 at the Vienna State Opera at Mozart, in Mozart's The Abduction from the Sarah Gellio. In 1986, Sir George Solti chose him to become the assistant conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, a position he held for five years under both Solti and Daniel Birnbaum. He became music director of the Oakland East Bay Symphony in 1990. Maestro Morgan serves as artistic director of the Oakland Youth Orchestra, music director of the Sacramento Philharmonic Orchestra and the Sacramento Opera, and was artistic director of of the Festival Opera in Walnut Creek in California for more than 10 seasons. He teaches the graduate conducting course at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and is music director at the Bear Valley Music Festival here in California. As stage director, he has led productions of the Bernstein Mass at the Oakland Symphony and a modern staging of Mozart's Don Giovanni at Festival Opera, where he has also staged Britain's A Midsummer Night's Dreams and Gnode's Faust. As a chamber musician, he has appeared on the Chamber Music Alive series in Sacramento, as well as the occasional appearance in the Bay Area. As a guest conductor, he's appeared with America's most major orchestras, including the New York Philharmonic, National Symphony, Baltimore Symphony, and the Philadelphia Orchestra. As a conductor of opera, he's performed with the St. Louis Opera Theater, New York City Opera, and the Städtisper in Berlin. Abroad, he's conducted orchestras in Europe, South America, the Middle East, and throughout the world. In 2005, he was honored by the San Francisco chapter of the Recording Academy with the 2005 Governor's Award for Community Service. 
And on the opposite coast, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers chose Morgan as one of the five 2005 Concert Music Award recipients. In addition to his duties with the symphony, Maestro Morgan serves as artistic director of the Oakland Symphony Youth Orchestra, music director at Bear Valley Music Festival, as well as the music director of the Gateways Music Festival. He is a music director emeritus of the San Sacramento Philharmonic and Opera, and is on the boards of Oaktown Jazz Workshops, the Purple Silk Music Education Foundation, and the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute. Please welcome Michael. And last but not least, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sean Dorsey. Sean Dorsey is a San Francisco-based transgender choreographer, dancer, writer, and advocate, and a longtime repeat grantee of the San Francisco Arts Commission. Recognized as the US's first acclaimed transgender modern dance choreographer, Dorsey has toured his work to 30 cities and taught in 35. Dorsey has been awarded four Isadora Duncan Dance Awards, the Goldie Award Performance, and has been named San Francisco's Best Dance Company by SF Weekly, and was also named in Dance Magazine's 25 to Watch. This summer, Mr. Dorsey became the first U.S. transgender artist ever presented by the Joyce Theater in New York City. Dorsey has been awarded support from the National Endowment for the Arts, NEFA's National Dance Project, National Performance Network, Dance USA, California Arts Council, the Arts Commission in San Francisco, the Creative Work Fund, and many others of you here in the room. Dorsey is the founder and artistic director of Fresh Meat Productions, the nation's first nonprofit to create, present, and tour year-round transgender dance and performing arts programs. Founded in 2002, Fresh Meat Productions is now celebrating its 17th season. Fresh Meat Productions builds community by creating, presenting, and touring year-round transgender performing arts programs. Their award-winning programs invest in trans and queer artists as powerful agents of change, promote trans and QTPOC expression and visibility, provide mentorship and learning, and promote racial and transgender justice. Fresh Meat Productions' guiding principles are access, relevance, artistic excellence, and community engagement. Please welcome Sean Dorsey. And with that, I will leave them to um, lead us through our morning. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we're awake, we're alive, we are together. I want to thank, first of all, Karina Gould for that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, prayer grounding us in our hearts and in this land and in our ancestors who are with us at every step in our lives and in our work. My name is Maklit Hadero. I am an Ethiopian-American singer, musician, cultural activist, and TED Senior Fellow. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And my family and I left when I was just under two years old. We came to this country as refugees, fleeing the violence of the post-revolution time in Ethiopia. We were in DC and Iowa and Brooklyn and Florida, and I've been here in the Bay Area for the past 14 years. On the one hand, I work in what you might recognize as the music industry. I write songs and record albums and make music videos and tour around North America and Europe and East Africa. And as a cultural activist, I'm involved in projects and programs and initiatives that harness the power of music to help us ask who we are, where we're going, and how we are going to get there collectively. I started as a cultural activist during my time as co-director of the Red Poppy Art House in San Francisco, a tiny little interdisciplinary arts and culture space where I learned the axiom that has driven much of the work in my career, which is that the more space you make for other artists, the more space you make for yourself. There is no difference between your growth as a community and your growth as an individual artist. Thank you. Thank you. 
from there, my work became more international in scope. I co-founded the Nile Project with Egyptian ethnomusicologist Mina Girgis, where we brought musicians together from the 11 countries of the Nile River, of which Ethiopia is one, and we created music together and learned from each other and toured the river and toured the world. And in that project, we were showing a way for the world to learn from East Africa about how culture can be a part of stewarding a healthy and unified ecology. And I've also done projects locally like the Home Away From Home project where I curated a group of 10 East African immigrant artists from the Bay Area and they were all commissioned to create music and visual art and poetry and film based on migration stories from community members. We did multiple oral histories as part of that project and created an installation on Lake Merritt that was inspired by the design of an Ethiopian and Eritrean traditional house where we proudly proclaimed that we are here part and deep part of the Bay Area immigrant and the Bay Area community. Um, but my songs, my music are also cultural activism. I make migration music, migration music. I make music that sings my two homelands, music that is deeply Ethiopian and deeply American, full of six, eight grooves and pentatonic horns and a singer-songwriter's storyteller, storytelling and strum. And that process for me, that music that I write, that is, it is Ethio jazz, music that's hyphenated like me. And it began in a conversation that I had with Mulatu Astatke when he came to a show of mine in Addis Ababa and he took me aside after the show and he kind of whispered, he was like looking right in my face and he said, Oh Maklit, oh Maklit, do not play Ethio jazz like we created it 50 years ago. He said, what are you going to do to take this music forward? And I thought and I thought and I meditated and I meditated and I meditated and I realized that my Ethio jazz, to be authentic to me, would have to center and privilege stories of migration. My Ethio jazz would be migration music and that's why I called my last album when the people move, the music moves too. When the people move, the music moves too. And also by centering jazz, by centering jazz, I'm also recognizing that story that every door that opens for me in this culture, in every door that opens, I'm standing on the shoulders of the struggles for dignity and self-determination made by African-American peoples in this country. I recognize that with every step, with every note, and with every breath. When I sing my hyphenated celebratory songs, my Ethio jazz songs, I sing world music that is American music. World music that is American music. My Ethio jazz is one part soundtrack to a world defined by inclusivity with open armed borders and plenty of seats at the table, plenty of seats at the table because a globalized world cannot be undone. Interdependence, interdependence is the name of the game. My music and cultural activist work often comes back to this question. Who do we mean when we say the word we? Who do we mean when we say the word we? I ask this question at community levels, at municipal levels, at the state level, at the national level, and internationally. We has big implications. I have a degree in political science from Yale University, and in my time there, I spent a lot of time in classes studying nation building, which has everything to do with who you mean when you say the word we. It determines policy, it determines who can come into this country, it determines how we interact with the rest of the world. Well, music is always at the heart of we, at the heart of how a culture defines itself. So when we look at the hyphenated American identity, when we look at immigrant music, we are looking at the American narrative, at who we mean when we say the word we. I make music to be mirror and hammer and chisel and telescope and microscope and clay to shape that we, to reflect it, to widen it, 
to widen it because we need to be wider and we need to be bigger and bigger and more inclusive in order to survive, in order to survive. Right now, the project driving my work in this field is a new podcast called Movement, telling stories of global migration through music. Movement centers music as a powerful medium to connect audiences to immigrant and refugee narratives. Movement wants to hit people at the level of the hips and the heart and the head. As the great Somali British poet Warsan Shire says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And that means the minute you talk about migration, you're looking at large-scale social issues like climate change and xenophobia and citizenship and belonging. And the, our podcast then intersects those issues with the very personal lived experiences of musicians whose life work turns those questions into songs. And music is also something that's deeply intimate in our lives, and I want to end just by, by bringing it back to an intimate space of reflection around what cultural activism means. And I once heard a story from the great singer, composer, and activist, Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan, the founder of Sweet Honey and the Rock, who is one of my heroes. And she said that in the 60s, when, when they were planning protests, the group would often sing that song, This Little Light of Mine. And they'd sing it in big gatherings, but really the real power of that song, she said the real power of that song was when you would sing it alone at 6 a.m. before you left for the march in the morning to give yourself the strength to move forward when you didn't know how the day would end. And that is the power of music to tell you in a simple phrase that you are important. Your participation is important. And it's also to give you a little joy when gravity feels too heavy. That too is cultural activism. Y'all, we got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. May the music for you be a lift and a balm and a salve. May the songs be there for you when you need them the most. Thank you. During these times we find ourselves in, the prime directive at the Oakland Symphony is to bring people together. Here are a few examples of how we try to do that, and I'm only going to talk about our main stage concerts and not the third of our budget that goes towards education. We play all the people you'd expect us to, then we push our audience with music that's off the usual regional orchestra path, like this Shostakovich A Symphony heard here. It's a grim hour of music for a grim time, so everyone can relate. <laughs> then we have our American Masterwork series, Great Works of Musical Theater, because those are America's masterworks, like Bernstein's Candide, Sondheim's Follies, Kurt Weill's Street Scene, the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, all presented in concert hall staging. The series began with a staging of the Bernstein Mass. Another was Guys and Dolls, all with diverse casts 
of mostly local performers, many of whom have large followings of their own. Our great challenge is the turnover in population that is forced by the insane real estate prices around here. We're constantly having to reintroduce ourselves to new residents. our signature series, Notes From. Each season, there's a concert that explores the music from a segment of our community that is otherwise underrepresented in our audience. This is a rehearsal with singer-songwriter Diana Gameros for the Notes From Mexico concert. We've done notes from India, notes from Armenia, Persia, we had to do twice, the Middle East, and other places. For our notes from Vietnam uh, concert, our guest artist was composer Vanessa Vo, who runs a school that teaches traditional Vietnamese instruments and music. She was also a bridge to the large Vietnamese population in the South Bay. We sometimes get up crying at these concerts because people see music on the stage that they never thought would be given such a platform. The concerts are half notes from and then half standard repertory so that all these new people can see what an orchestra normally does. We also juxtapose with different audiences, juxtapose pieces with different audiences, so that we bring together, for example, the time we did a Schubert symphony, followed by a big hip-hop premiere on the same concert. So the Schubert people and the hip-hop people had to be in the same room. Uh, when, when I planned notes from Native America, I had no idea that there were so many tribes represented in the region. It was a concert that had not a single box office piece on it, and yet was one of our biggest sellers that season. This piece, which was composed by John Wineglass, Big Sur, The Night Sun, was premiered by the Monterey Symphony and required two traditional drums that were about 12 feet high on opposite sides of the stage. That was a moving feat. You'll see it as we move, as the camera moves to the right. So that drum at the back, which he had to climb up a set of stairs to play. We also played music by Native American composer Gerard Tate. Last year, there was Notes from LGBTQ America, which included the Benjamin Britten Serenade, featuring tenor Jonathan Blaylock and our own principal horn, Meredith Brown. Meredith was our token non-LGBTQ person on that concert. Then we did a Sanson piano concerto with one of my favorite artists on the planet, trans pianist Sarah Davis Buchner. She is beyond great. And a piece we commissioned from Broadway composers Tim Rosser and Charlie Sohn called With the Right Music, which is about navigating a high school as a shy gay kid who is helped by meeting a rather flamboyant friend. 
TV star Noah Galvin and YouTube star John Cozart were the two lead characters. It's a really great piece, and I'm hoping someday to get it properly recorded and videoed while Mr. Galvin and Mr. Cozart still look young enough to play high schoolers. <laughs> this year we're doing notes from the African diaspora, and next year notes from Korea. It's like I belong with the right song. This year, I just said, oh, a long, now, a long-held idea that I finally get to do this year because of the Wallace Foundation, thank you, Wallace Foundation, is called Playlist. For Playlist, we invite a great mind and a big personality to curate a concert and tell, us, tell everyone why they picked what they picked. It began with comedian, activist W. Kamau Bell, seen here off to the right. It also sold out. That's Mississippi Goddamn, by the way, that ended the concert. This year, it will be civil rights icon Dolores Huerta, and next year, CEO of Kaiser Permanente, Bernard Tyson. We put the orchestra, our regular collaborators, Jazz Mafia, and our chorus at their disposal so they can choose music from any genre, and Kamal certainly did. Big hit with the young crowd, less so with the older audience, but the point was the young crowd. <laughs> now, that's how we do some of what we do. If you like to hear more, you know where to find me, and I can assure you, we play all of your favorite dead people from Europe all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I love being transgender. I love being transgender. Can you imagine? I love my transgender body. I love choreographing dances from the graceful, informed, and powerful location of my transgender body. I love my trans political consciousness and artistic aesthetic and dogged determination to stay alive and thrive in a world that would rather I did not stay alive or thrive. I love being transgender. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Because I sure couldn't growing up. As a kid, I loved dance with every fiber in my tiny little queer body. At home, I danced around constantly in my pink leotard to my fame and Rock 81 vinyl albums. But I didn't grow up getting to go to dance class or do any professional dance training. And I never, never, never imagined that I could ever dance professionally because I never saw a single person like me in dance. I never saw a single trans person in dance. A dancer, a choreographer, a dance teacher, a funder, or even an usher taking my ticket at the door on my way into the theater. Trans people were completely absent. So how on earth could I imagine that being my future? How could I imagine becoming a professional dancer? let alone a choreographer who would tour his company's work to 30 cities across the U.S. and around the world, who would teach as an openly and proud transgender dance educator in schools in over 35 cities, who would become the first transgender dance artist and organization ever awarded support by the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you, because I did. How could I imagine when I didn't see a single person like me in the room? Imagination is no inconsequential thing. Imagination keeps us alive. It literally keeps us alive. 
Transgender and gender non-conforming people's suicide rate is 22 times higher than the general population. Driven by bullying, violence, discrimination, and lack of seeing themselves reflected and represented anywhere positively, one third of trans youth try or succeed at committing suicide. And 40% of trans adults, 40% have tried at least one time to kill ourselves. Picture 40% of this room. So I'm not doing the math, but I'm pretty sure that means we're losing a lot of my people. Imagination is the difference between life and death because the larger culture and the current culture of grant making in this country offers trans people no version of a future where we belong and when, where we are worthy of being loved and held up into leadership where we can creatively express ourselves with confidence and authority and a supportive and celebratory audience. That is my life's work as an artist and an organizer. In 2001, I made the big move to San Francisco. <laughs> it was going to be great. I was going to finally find all those hundreds of other professional transgender modern dance choreographers out there, right? <laughs> But 17 years ago, it turned out, nobody was putting trans and gender non-conforming artists on stage and nobody was funding our art. So 17 years ago, I brought together a group of transgender and gender non-conforming artists and activists and founded Fresh Meat Productions, the first organization of our kind in the US. And 17 years later, Fresh Meat Productions is a thriving mid-sized nonprofit working for trans and racial justice and here today on the stage asking you to get started on working on trans equity. You're welcome. <laughs> Fresh Meat Productions invests in the creative expression and cultural leadership of transgender and gender non-conforming communities. And since 2002, we have paid, commissioned, and presented over 500 transgender, gender non-conforming, and queer artists, over two-thirds of whom are artists of color. We have invested $1.7 million directly into the hands and bodies and dreams of transgender and gender non-conforming and queer artists. So Fresh Meat Productions organizes performing arts programs and events. Some of you may be familiar with our Fresh Meat Festival of Transgender and Queer Performance every June, uh, which centers the work of transgender and gender non-conforming and queer artists of color. We create, commission, and perform new work via our resident dance company, Sean Dorsey Dance, and our Fresh Works commissioning program which awards funds to transgender, gender non-conforming, and queer artists of color to create new work. I'm going to see if this technology works. Excellent. We offer engagement and education programs, trans-supportive dance workshops, trans-led guest teaching, lectures, in-school residencies, and trans and LGBTQ community forums. And our national advocacy program, Transform Dance, the first of its kind in the country, provides resources, education, training, and leadership development in order to identify and remove systematic barriers, increase trans participation and leadership, and advance trans equity in dance. So right now in this moment, with no glamorous segue, I would like to show you a couple of slides which, with full disclosure, will increase the time of my talk by two minutes over my allotted time slot. <laughs> so, as a trans person on this stage, which has held up and supported very few trans people in the history of this organization, and in a room full of very few of my people, may I ask for your consent to go over time? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Moving along. White people. Us white folks in leadership have to do better and do more, and we have to make it our first priority to do daily work on ourselves, our organizations, and in the field on dismantling and crushing white supremacy and racism. This is our work to do. Come on, white people, make some noise. That's always an awkward request, right? Okay, so... 
This also means that we have to enrich our conversations about racial equity to talk about transgender and gender nonconforming racial equity so that our work is propelled into action by knowing the fact that the average life expectancy in the United States of America of a black transgender woman is 35 years old. Okay, so I'm going to ask you all in the field to ask yourselves and ask your colleagues to start using the word crisis to talk about the fact that currently the field is almost totally excluding the bodies, voices, and leadership of my people, transgender and gender nonconforming people in dance. And when we start using the word crisis, we can start taking action and responsibility and responding to this as a crisis, right? Second thing I want you to know is that LGBTQ initiatives and categories in your guidelines and grants and fundings aren't reaching trans people. You need to create new categories and guidelines for us. Unfortunately, non-trans, lesbian, and gay folks have thrown us under the bus or left us behind plenty of times, and right now is becoming a very lucrative time for non-transgender, heterosexual, and non-transgender, lesbian, and gay folks to start submitting really slick grants about trans projects. So please know that LGBT grants and initiatives are mostly not reaching my people. Okay, also, everyone is talking about um, us having a trans moment in America right now, but this is a trans moment without any investment in transgender and gender non-conforming bodies, voices, or leadership. And to me, that's not a trans moment, that's a crisis. And something that I'm already seeing a lot, even in the Bay Area, is that very well-resourced, non-transgender-led organizations are submitting, again, very slick grant proposals and getting funding for projects that are um, purported to be about gender identity or trans issues. So please, do not fund projects, organizations, or initiatives about gender identity or trans issues unless they are conceived, created, led, performed, and evaluated by trans and gender non-conforming people. Thank you. Take a picture, remind yourself when you get home. Thank you for letting me put in those bonus two minutes of slides. Okay. So, in the other 37 hours of my day, <laughs> I'm also a dance maker. I'm a choreographer and the artistic director of Sean Dorsey Dance, which is one of the programs of Fresh Meat Productions. And I make beautiful and award-winning dances through deep transgender and gender non-conforming and queer community engagement. My last work, The Missing Generation, gives voice to transgender and LGBTQ longtime survivors of the early part of the AIDS epidemic. And I created this work after recording 75 hours of oral history interviews with transgender and LGBTQ longtime survivors of the early AIDS epidemic and holding intergenerational community forums on HIV AIDS in six cities. And in the 20 cities where we have gotten to perform this work on tour so far, with support from the NEA and National Dance Project and NEN and NPN and Dance USA and many others, we lead free activities including trans supportive dance workshops, free generations positive intergenerational community forums on HIV AIDS and lots more. So right now we're in the midst of another concurrent 20 city tour of our newest work, Boys in Trouble which unpacks contemporary masculinity with unflinching, and I do mean unflinching, honesty, and from unapologetically trans and queer perspectives. We also created this work after leading workshops and community forums across the country, and the work on stage and the residence we do, residences we do in community look at transgender embodiment, toxic masculinity, queer, black love and joy, body shame, violence, and trauma, real talk about whiteness, and a witness to the hurt and heartache and shame that are waged by masculinity in this country. And last but not least, my new work, the work that I am just starting work on now, is about imagination. 
at the very time that this country is bearing down on transgender and gender non-conforming bodies and voices and rights and creative expression, when we are under violent and life-threatening attacks, I want to give my communities the space to dream. I want us to ask each other what is possible. So over the next three years, pending successful fundraising, I'm going to create a new show by traveling across the U.S. where I'll be hosted by the project's commissioners and I'll organize and host Dream Labs. Free, supportive, creative community spaces where I invite transgender and gender non-conforming people to come and say and dance and write and storytell what it is they most want because this is a terrifying time for my people to think expansively. So this is an important time for my people to think expansively. This is an important time for our and our imagination. So I'll work in communities over the next three years and in 2021 when Fresh Meat Productions will be celebrating our 20th anniversary season, Sean Dorsey Dance will birth this new show, I Do Still Have a Womb, in San Francisco and will undertake what we hope will be another 20 city tour. So I will hang out after uh, the chat and I would love to connect and be a resource and connect you to amazing organizations and artists and projects in each of your communities. I thank you so much for your time and letting me go over. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.